King Charles I raised his standard at Nottingham on August the 22nd, 1642. Every effort to avoid civil war had failed, and now the differences between Parliament and King were about to be resolved in the time-honoured way on the battlefield. When one looks at reasons for the civil war, there are no simple, straightforward reasons which apply across the board. Uh, in England, there was an argument about who was going to control the expenditure of government. Was it going to be Parliament? Was it going to be the King? There was an argument in Scotland about religion. What form of Protestantism was going to hold sway there? In Ireland, the worry was that the Catholic powers of Europe would use Ireland as a stepping stone to come into England, coupled with the fact the king marries a Catholic wife. And so the Protestants of England are worried about Catholic takeover. The fact is you've got a mess, a real mess of arguments with a whole lot of special interests, which the king, King Charles, in his infinite wisdom, manages to unite into a single united opposition. A considerable achievement. The king makes an attempt to take over parliament or take out the troublesome MPs by force. That fails. And eventually he raises his standard at Nottingham. The first pitched battle came at Edge Hill in October 1642. The indiscipline of the Royalist cavalry probably cost Charles outright victory there. But even so, many historians agree that if the King had marched quickly on London afterwards, as he was urged to do, then the war could have ended very swiftly and very differently. But he didn't, and the scene was set for almost two more years of inconclusive fighting. Prior to Naseby, what has happened is, an, is a stalemate. The king falls back to Oxford, and so what you've got is the development of the attempt to create centres of um, influence, centres of power, which will enable you to surround and control the enemy and to defeat him in the field. Parliament have got London, they've got Cambridge, they've got Kings Lynn, Northampton, a little bit beyond, and then swaying around, so the whole of East Anglia. The king is controlling, by and large, most of the rest of the country at this point. And it, that is eroded over time. And the balance is even between the two sides. How are you going to get out of this mess? So that's the problem at the beginning of the year. The war may have dragged on, but it gave both sides plenty of time to get to grips with the weapons of the era. In the evolution of warfare, the conflict in 17th century England was now seeing firepower starting to appear all over the battlefield. Gone was the rare and cumbersome handguns of the Middle Ages, and in their place the musket, firing armour piercing lead balls, was now commonplace. The musket was the forerunner of the guns that we see dominating the battlefield of today, but the matchlock, so called because it used a slow burning piece of cord to ignite the gunpowder, was probably less effective than the medieval longbow in combat. Unlike the longbow, which took a lifetime of practice to master, a musketeer could be trained in a matter of weeks, which made the weapon popular with two armies that were being hastily put together. Historical firearm expert Ian Hen told us more. So Ian, tell me about what you've got here. Well, basically what, what we've got here is uh, Early matchlock musket. It was uh, sort of the first of what you think is a looking like a, a bit like a modern firearm. Oh. It's a uh, muzzle loading, black powder, yeah. and it's uh, it fires with the uh, with the match. So very temperamental. Then I would have thought to try and light the match. Very unreliable, especially yeah. in uh, poor weather conditions. Yeah. The match could go out. It could burn at different rates. Sometimes the powder would go in the pan, but not ignite the main charge. It could blow out with the wind, it could go out with the rain. So not great uh, if you're on a battlefield. No, no, you've got and, people rushing around. And often got... it would turn into a club. Yeah. Resort to yeah. yielding it. Uh, there was no actual standard. And isn't there a famous saying that comes from this? That's right, yeah, keep it under your hat. So the, uh, the match, because it was unreliability, they, they would carry a lot of spare and they would coil it up and they would stick under the hat to try and keep it dry. And that's where, keep and that's it where under keeping hat. something under your hat comes from. Fantastic. They were quite a terror weapon. They were quite impressive. There was a big, a big flash big flame out the end, a lot of smoke, and in mass battles with volley fire, they could be effective against uh, infantry. Oh, 
So how are we going to demonstrate how effective this weapon is? Well, uh, we'll get ourselves ready, we'll uh, light the match and we'll uh, try against some targets. Brilliant. And see how you get on. Okay, look forward to it. Can I have a go? You certainly can, yeah. See how your aim is. Whoa. Wow. What a range. What a, that's just absolutely, there was a bit of a kick on it as well. I wasn't expecting that. Yeah, yeah. And also I wasn't expecting it to take so long on the, on the no. press of the trigger. I had to keep the trigger mm. down and wait. That is one of the problems with the match lock that uh, if the match is not hot enough, you have to keep blowing on it. The wind, it can, it can take the heat out of it. Uh, yeah. it, it hits a, a, a patch where there's not very much saltpeter in the hemp rope. It's unbelievable because really you don't know when it's going to go off. It's, no, it, you, they it's, are it's, notoriously I, I, unreliable. I don't, know if I, I don't know if I'd like to be on a battlefield with loads of people trying to kill me when waiting with my finger on the, on the trigger waiting for it to go off. No. Well, yeah. that, that, this is the uh, a weapon of the English Civil War and towards the end of the Civil War they had the early flint knocks which are known as dog locks and uh, we've got a dog lock for you to try so okay. basically the same weapon but you'll see it's a Bit, a little bit more controlled. A slightly more reliable ignition system. Did I just shoot that bird in the top of the tree? <laughs> <laughs> so we'll, uh, we'll have a go with the, okay. uh, the dog lock and see how you get on. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> the dog or wheel lock musket was the first self-igniting firearm in place of the unreliable match. A rotating steel wheel rubbed against a piece of pyrite, generating intense sparks which ignited gunpowder in the pan, which in turn ignited the main charge in the barrel similar in action to a modern cigarette lighter, and this ignition system was far more reliable than the earlier match lock. And another shot. Did I get him? You did, yes. Oh, I singed my hair as well. Oh, do you know what? I like this one. I don't like the match lock. I like this. I really like this gun. It's got a nice feel to it. It's um, not as um, much of a kickback as the match. No, either. it's not. It's, it's quite a heavy gun and it's quite a long gun. Yeah. They would have, a lot of the time they would have fired these from a, a long rest with a fork in the top. But being long and fairly heavy, it helps you to keep the muzzle down. Yeah. And uh, that's why you were, it looked like you were pretty yeah. much in the should, centre of the torso. Should we go so and have a look and see where I got this time? Let's have a look, see okay. what you've done again. So yeah, you can see a couple more holes in. Yeah, you've. Uh, oh, look at that! You've clipped him again. Look at that! I got him. I got him. That was the match lock. Yeah, that's right. And this one here. Look at that! And look at the. Is that why is it not completely round? Is that just because of the way it's entered into the? <coughs> it's just the way it's splintered. I'm, I'm mean, quite happy with that, you know. Yeah, that that's that is good shooting with this with this type of weapon. Any any shot in a torso with a, a ball of that size. If you've got a three quarter inch ball in your hip. Yeah. That's going to put you out of action, yeah. and yeah. you're not you're not going to be fighting that battle anymore. No, and you may well end up dying of your wounds. 